everybody. My name is Ann Coombe, and I'm the Director of Clinical Services at St. Leonard's Community Services. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to come and hear this information. We want you to know that we do sincerely appreciate it. You've come here this evening because you have a vested interest in your community and its members, be that family, friends, neighbours or colleagues. This evening is all about providing you with information and resources to the best of our ability. To bring as much attention as possible to this important awareness campaign, we're pleased to have Rogers TV join us to film some of our presentations this evening. Please note that tonight's event is not airing live in real time, but will in fact be edited to run at a later date. If anyone has any concerns about being included in the broadcast, we ask that you please let us know and we'll be sure that Rogers is made aware. We anticipate our presentations this evening to take two to two and a half hours, and we want to include lots of time for your questions. We do understand that some of the information presented this evening may be triggering and upsetting for some. So if you or someone uh, you're with require support in any way, we ask that you reach out uh, we have a number of St. Leonard's Community Services staff members here this evening. They can be identified by their lanyards, and I'm actually going to ask our St. Leonard's staff to briefly stand up. You'll see them at the back. Um, so please don't hesitate to, uh, to connect with them um, if you need support or information regarding resources. To provide opening remarks for this evening is a gentleman who I see working tirelessly to keep our citizens safe. It was in fact Chief Nelson who brought, first brought a group of community providers together back last June to identify the serious concern with fentanyl. He asked that we all begin to work together to raise awareness with the goal of saving lives. Tonight is about sharing this information with you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Chief Jeff, Jeff Nelson of the Brantford Police Services. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Sanderson Center, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, before we begin, I do want to uh, let you know that tonight's forum has only been made possible because of the efforts of St. Leonard's Community Services the Brant County Health Unit, and the City of Brantford, in particular, the Safe Brantford team. So could you please join me in thanking them? You're going to find tonight uh, very informative, very interesting, uh, and you may also find it perhaps a little shocking. Tonight, you are going to learn about the fentanyl and other opioids, the impact that illicit fentanyl can have on a community. You will learn about the antidote to an opioid overdose called naloxone. And you'll also be introduced to a remarkable website, fentanylcankill.ca. Before I turn the forum over to the experts, I've been asked to share with you some basic information about fentanyl and why it is such a concern for us that it's in our community. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's manufactured. Legal fentanyl is typically prescribed by physicians for the management of severe pain. Then there's illegal fentanyl, typically imported from other countries, often China, but also capable of being produced locally in illegal laboratories. Illegal fentanyl is found in powder and liquid forms. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more toxic than morphine. It's odorless, it's tasteless. It can be cut into other substances such as ecstasy, heroin, MDMA, and cocaine. It can be used to make fake pills like oxycodone and Percocet. It can even be used to lace marijuana. It's highly addictive, and even the smallest amount, just the size of two grains of salt, can be fatal. So who's at risk? All users. 
those who are knowingly using fentanyl, and those that could have no idea that fentanyl has been introduced to their drug of choice. And with the prevalence of marijuana use, it's chilling to think that even marijuana could be laced with fentanyl. So how big of a concern is it really? Well, last year, 2016, in British Columbia, specifically Surrey, British Columbia, they experienced 20 fentanyl-related overdoses in a 24-hour period of time. Shortly after that, the school board and police service co-authored a letter sent home to all parents, warning of fentanyl being the primary ingredient in fake oxycodone and Percocet pills. What does that tell us about the age of those 20 overdose victims? Last year, 2016, ended with 922 overdose deaths in British Columbia. So that's Western Canada. What does this have to do with Brantford? Well, we've been monitoring the prevalence of illicit fentanyl and other opioids in Western Canada, and we've noticed an accelerated migration of the substance to the east. We noticed not only increased seizures of fentanyl by law enforcement and border service agencies, but we also began to see communities reporting increased numbers of overdoses and deaths. So in June last year, so not quite a year ago, here in Brantford, we experienced four overdoses and a death in about an 18-hour time period. In October last year, so maybe six months ago, here in Brantford, we saw four fentanyl-related overdoses. All survived. Three were rev revived through the use of Narcan, Naloxone. Two of the individuals were out pushing a baby stroller when they overdosed. In February of this year, Six Nations experienced a fentanyl overdose and what they believe to be a fentanyl-related death. We're now hearing from Brant County Ambulance that on average, they are responding to one opioid-related overdose every day. So in June of last year, shortly after the weekend where we saw four overdoses and a death in our community, the first meeting of what has become known as the Community Fentanyl Roundtable took place. The roundtable is comprised of representatives from emergency services, healthcare, addiction services, education, corrections, media, social services, and the city of Brantford. Agencies who are concerned about the prevalence of fentanyl in our community and want to be a part of developing and delivering a strategy to mitigate the devastating impact this substance could have on a community. A substance so devastating that the immediate objective of the roundtable was to save lives by increasing community awareness about the lethal risks associated to fentanyl. And the message, don't use drugs, will not save lives. Addiction and attitudes toward drug use makes this issue far more complex than that. Instead, we're trying to keep people alive by telling them that they should know where they're getting their drugs because it may be laced with fentanyl. That if they are intentionally using fentanyl, they should know the dangers. Because the risk of overdose is so high, they should not use this substance alone. They should know the symptoms of overdose. They should not be afraid to call 911. They should know where to obtain naloxone. And they should also know where in our community they can find help to deal with their addiction. Uh, tonight's a very important part of the education and awareness campaign. Your being here to learn about fentanyl and opioids and addiction is very important. But equally important is your sharing this information with others. And to assist you in sharing this information with others, the Community Roundtable created a website that contains all of the information that you'll ever need, fentanylcankill.ca. And you'll hear more about this website later. Can I ask you to please take out your smartphones? Just go ahead, take out your cell phones. Pull up a contact of yours that is not here right now, 
and get ready to send them a text message. Just put your hand up once you're, uh, you have a, you're ready to go so I can know. I'll tell you what to say. All right, very good. OMG. No, I'm just kidding. Don't use <laughs> OMG. All right. All right. Try this out. Have you heard about fentanyl? Check out fentanylcankill.ca. Have you heard about fentanyl? Check out fentanylcankill.ca. And put your usual number of emojis behind that so they'll know it's actually you sending it. And then press send. You'll never know whose life you might save by simply sharing this information. We can't assume that everyone knows about the dangers of fentanyl. And if you want to be a part of saving lives, all I ask of you is that you spread the word, that you speak to your friends, your colleagues, and most importantly, that you speak to your family members about the dangers of fentanyl. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I know you're going to find it very informative. Your being here tonight tells me that you're not only interested in the fentanyl and opioids and addiction, it also means that you want to be a part of making our community safer. And for that, I thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you so much, Chief Nelson. Your dedication to the community is nothing short of outstanding. So for now for our keynote presentation, I'd like to introduce to you Detective Constable Chris Auger of the Ontario Provincial Police. Chris is going to speak to you this evening on a presentation we're calling Opioids 101. Chris truly is our expert um, in uh, regarding this information. Um, and we will uh, spend some time on questions after Chris's presentation. Take it away, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, to start off with, uh, lights are really bright up here. Uh, it feels like I'm working on my base tan right now for the summer. And as well, I have thick, luxurious hair. It's just the lighting that's telling you differently right now. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Brant County OPP for having me out here in the uh, Organized Crime Enforcement Bureau. I think any time that we come out to these things, there has to be some sort of buy-in. You as a person has to come out here and sort of identify the reason why you're out here. The reason why we're out here is because opioids cause death. We do a lot of work with the Chief Moore's office. We go out, as you heard the Chief talking about overdoses that we go to. Uh, 2008 was a big year that we sort of went through. 2008 was a year that we noticed we started doing a barometer sort of with uh, the Chief Coroner's office. We noticed that that year there was 120 deaths that happened by drowning. If you kind of remember when you open up the paper that summer, it seemed like there always seemed to be mass drownings that occurred. Um, 350 people died of opioid overdoses and 350 people died in motor vehicle collisions. We jump ahead 2014, 80 people died of, of uh, drownings. So as a province, we probably became better swimmers. But as well, we did a huge educational campaign that went through. There was kind of an awkward OPP guy that was kind of standing there telling you about not to stand around dams or anything along those lines. Um, but then we saw a spike happen. We saw a spike happen in motor vehicle collisions. 481 people died that year in motor vehicle collisions. Even more so, we saw 527 people die of opioid overdoses. If you include alcohol and opioids, it jumps up to about 700 people. On the way here to driving, I saw a whole bunch of highway signs that said, don't drink and drive. Drinking and driving, uh, the amount of people that died last year of that, 69 people. Codeine alone accounted for 45 people. Today, I'm going to educate you on the different ways that opioids work. We're going to talk about fentanyl, and I'm going to give you a better vernacular and understanding for the way that it sort of comes about. But as well, one really disturbing thing that we saw with the OPP as a trend coming up, drug use in youths. This is Michigan. Michigan tends to have a lot of studies that go on from, uh, this is actually a University of Michigan study. It shows in Michigan, the number one drug that's used by teenagers coming up, marijuana hashish. Uh, 2018, July 1st, apparently is a big date for people that use uh, marijuana hashish. Number two, synthetic marijuana. And I'll tell you right now, synthetic marijuana has nothing to do with marijuana at all. All it is is hallucinogenic property sprayed on uh, green leafy material. Number three is Adderall, study buddies. Really popular in the university crowd. And you can take a look at fifth from the bottom, 
Oxycontin at 4.3%. We take a look at the Ontario High School Drug Survey 2015. We take a look at number one. Number one is always alcohol. Why? Because things have not changed since I've been a kid on a Friday night. You go down to the beer store, you look for the sketchy looking guy, you give him 20 bucks, you have a six pack for the weekend. It hasn't changed, I guarantee it's always that way. Number two, high energy caffeine drinks. Caffeine, cocaine kind of came out in society at the same time. Caffeine became the socially acceptable one. Hence, we have a, a ton of caffeine. High energy ca caffeine drinks is big. Number three, cannabis. Coming up at 20%. But you take a look at fifth from the top, or sixth from the top, opioid pain relievers. At a minimum of 10% and up to 13. But this is non-medicinal use. It doesn't count the kids that have prescriptions for codeine and that. They average about 15% of our youth are coming up using uh, prescription drugs. What they do is a thing called a farm party. They'll go into your medicine cabinets, into your grandparents' medicine cabinets, grab the pills, pour it into a bowl, call it trail mix, and start taking handfuls of stuff to see what the reaction is. Can you imagine the anticoagulants that happen in there, all the different drugs that they're taking, the different side effects that happen? We don't think it's a big, we even consider over-the-counter stuff as something we don't really consider. When was the last time you took a look at your Benadryl? Four kids, four teenage girls entered to uh, sick kids hospital. Three of them are picking things off their skin. The last one is in a 14 hour coma. The reason is they took uh, Benadryl, four hits of it. Teenage girl LSD. Basically, the one kid had an unknown mold allergy caused them to go into a coma for 14 hours. These are the type of things, these are innocuous things we don't look at, but these medicine cabinets are very important places to sort of go. So what are prescriptions? Prescriptions start off with are an authorization for you to have a drug as prescribed by a physician. Physician looks at a condition you have, turns around and says, you need to have a drug for it. So let's take a look right here. We'll take a look, it's Veda Simmons, anything Ontario. It'll say Tylenol-3. Tylenol-3 is the brand name. It'll always have an active ingredient. The active ingredient for Tylenol-3 is codeine, which we'll talk about later. Um, the root of menstruation, a lot of doctors on the prescriptions will write P-O, which is Latin for per ora, means by the mouth. Um, sometimes when I've seen fraudulent prescriptions come in, they'll have PE, PA, they won't understand sort of the root of administration that sort of goes along. You can only imagine if it was PA, the route that you'd probably have to take that pill would probably be very uncomfortable. Um, it gives a dose, one to two tablets every six hours, and gives the amount of tablets. And finally, it gives an authorized thing, doctor, and it'll have a five to six digit number after it. And that'll be the physician's doc, uh, called your physician number that'll be listed on it. The way abuse happens is, let's say for a minute, the chief is playing hockey on Friday night. His doctor tells him that it's okay to take a, a two codeine pills a day. It takes a little bit of a hard check into the corner, decides to take a third pill. Technically, he should have checked with his doctor to make sure it was all right. Prescription drug abuse happens that quickly, and it escalates. So, I was lucky enough to study some pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Western Ontario. And I'll tell you, I saw this slide come up and it meant so much to me especially in the policing grounds. This is called the roots of administration. These are the different ways that drugs sort of enact their way through their system. To start off with, people take drugs orally. What I mean by that is they goes, it enters into, you take it traditionally through the mouth, it goes and gets ingested by your GI tract, which is about two to 5% of the bioavailability of the drug. It's a very safe way for your body to have it. Your body has natural defenses to make sure it has the natural amount of bioavailability of the drug coming up. People that have addictions, which is another way to look at the root of addiction. Either make the molecule more powerful, say going from Oxycontin to fentanyl, or they'll change the root administration. The next thing they'll start doing is they'll start using it sublingually. So either they'll start grinding it outside of the mouth or they'll put the pill inside their mouth and ground it against the back molars. That way they start, if you reach underneath your throat, and this is how I can tell usually when people are sort of paying attention really into the conversation. If you reach underneath your throat, you'll feel your sublingual glands. You start getting about 10 to 15% of the active ingredient going that way. Finally, people are always chasing after that first rush, that first hit that they had of the drug. Next thing they'll start doing is inhaling it. Whether they start snorting it or say with a fentanyl patch, placing it upon tin foil and releasing it, heating it up and releasing the ingredients that way, inhaling it. Sometimes you get about 50% of the bioavailability of the drug and you get a quicker onset. And finally, when you want to get the full bioavailability of the drug, you go intravenous. Because there's no barriers anymore to actually get into the bloodstream. 
100% of the drug goes into your system. When a lot of times you're only supposed to get about 5% of the drug that sort of goes through. So Schedule 1, when we talk in policing, we talk about the schedules of the Controlled Drug and Substances Act. Schedule 1 has to do with your painkillers, your opioids. So the first classification of opioids are the natural. Codeine and morphine, first ones that first synthesized off the, uh, the poppy plant. So when it's cut two different ways, goes codeine, which is less powerful, and morphine, that's one center mark. Finally, we said, hey, we can make these opioids more powerful. Let's put them into a laboratory. And all we do is we add a hydrogen or an oxygen molecule to make it more powerful. If you take a look, semi-synthetics is hydromorphone or hydrocodone, a hydrogen molecule, or oxycodone or oxymorphone, something along those lines that make it more powerful. Finally, when we said, hey, we don't need nature anymore, we got a whole bunch of labs, we make two fully synthetic opioids that happen, and that's fentanyl and methanol, both very powerful drugs, and both very dangerous when taken. First is the lowest low, codeine. Codeine is one-tenth the strength of morphine. Easiest way to get codeine in Ontario? Well, you go up to your pharmacist, you ask for the over-the-counter cough syrup. In Ontario, there's a regulation that says you can get up to eight milligrams of codeine over the counter from the pharmacist. Uh, on the street, prices of codeine tend to be about 50 cents to a buck a milliliter. The reason is they go for prescription strength codeine. And the popular way they do it is called purple drank, or you might hear it called drank. Um, so basically what happened in Houston, Texas, Houston came up with a whole bunch of regulation that pushed down all the other opioids and left codeine alone. Street dealers, looking at the way that the sort of dynamics of it go, started to reach towards codeine. They started cutting it with Sprite, Jolly Ranchers, and they started putting into uh, Sprite bottles or into Gatorade bottles. The reason they did this is they cut it with those products. If you've ever drank codeine cough syrup, it's the most acidic thing you could possibly taste. So you sweeten it sour to give it a different chemical. On the street, it's known as syrup, the drank, uh, in Toronto, it's called the lean or level. As you can see, our great Canadian export right there, Mr. Beaver, tends to like it. Um, if you're on, if you ever come across, if you're a school teacher that's doing a school dance, or you're ever wondering if somebody has purple drink or anything like that, you take that, everybody's drank a Gatorade at some point in their life, you take that Gatorade bottle and you give it a quick shake. And if it fizzes, there's something else in there. Because we all know Gatorade doesn't fizz. It's been cut with something. There's something inside there. There's something you can see that's uh, tangible. We tell that to our officers that are on the road, and a lot of times they come across different, uh, we send it for testing, comes across this purple drink. So if you ever hear your kids using terms of Zurup, the drink, drank, Cody, schoolboy, if you're ever out in Eastern Ontario, I'm French Canadian, uh, pancakes and syrup, if you can imagine that, we tend to like our pancakes and syrup. So that's different vernacular you'll hear for codeine sort of used on the street. Second one is morphine. Morphine is a one centimeter mark. Everything comes off morphine. Codeine is one-tenth the strength. Morphine is a one-centimeter mark. Morphine becomes really valuable because morphine tends to start the branding. When you're on the street and you're doing a drug transaction, it is not like a big production that happens in Hollywood. It's not like huge teams swooping in and everything like that. It tends to be a very quick transaction of you showing your hand, showing exactly what you have, turning to that person, seeing if they want it. With morphine, branding starts. If you take a look at the slide, it has an M in a telltale box that comes around. People on the street look for this. On the street, morphine becomes 33 cents to a buck a milligram that's sort of sold. On the street, it's known as Emma, Monkey, M. So if you're ever talking with your kids or you're hearing people talk about monkey, there's a good chance they're not doing a lecture on primates. It's a good chance that they're not going to the Toronto Zoo. They might be talking about actually having taking morphine. So that's a really important one to know. So branding is where it starts. Because on the street, you don't have a lot of time to take a look to see what that product is. You want to see what it is, and you want to move on with the transaction. Morphine is the first one. Hydromorphone. Morphine added with a hydrogen molecule all of a sudden becomes six to eight times more powerful. Uh, morphine on the street can go anywhere from three bucks to five bucks a milligram. Can go up to the really popular ones on the street uh, tend to be the 24 or the 30 milligram ones. The reason why hydromorphone is very popular, it comes in capsule form. So people, as we talked earlier, people that want to abuse it by inhaling, just have to break that open and they can inhale it both ways with the capsule. It starts going through the nose. Or they can start putting it into a needle much easier because it's in a powdered form or granular form. On the streets, known as Dillies, Dilaudids, uh, the really popular ones 
are the 24 milligrams. And if you hear people talking about grays, they tend to deal with colors. Gray is the color of the 24 milligram. And finally, the 30 milligram one is called reds or red rockets. So if you're not in the Toronto area and people are not talking about the TTC or anything along those lines, you start hearing red rockets or anything along those lines, this is vernacular people use when they're talking about hydromorphone. When I first heard some of the prices about hydromorphone, I was working the drug unit and they're talking about hydros. Hydros is another vernacular they use and I thought, man, people are paying a lot of money for weed. Because back when I was younger, hydro meant hydroponic marijuana. I see some heads nodding right now. I'm not the only one, eh? Like, <laughs> hydroponic marijuana that sort of came out. We sort of see that, we started to see the prices. See, now I can see better out in the crowd as I'm a little bit closer, I can see a few head nods in that. Um, so hydroponic marijuana came along. The street term for hydro is switched and that's one of the things that we've seen. Hydros now need hydromorphones if you start hearing that vernacular as well. Oxycontin. Oxycontin is where we started seeing something really interesting happen when I started dealing with prescription drugs. To start off with, we started seeing levels of dealing sort of happen. So this person was given a prescription, of marijuana, or a prescription for Oxycontin. They turn around and they're behind on the rent for their month. Well, they're on the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan. They turn around, they have this bottle that has 30 pills. That is 40 milligrams, could be worth up to $40 a pill. Knows, I'm not gonna be able to hit my rent for the month. I can deal with pain for a little bit. I'm not a bad person, but this person right here, they're a little bit shadier than me. So I'm going to turn around and sell my pills to this person for $10 a pill. This person here is going to turn around and go, wow, I'm going to rip this prescription label off of it. And I'm going to say, I'm not a bad person because I know this kills people, but I still want to make a cut in this. So I'm going to turn around and turn it to our shadier person that actually, I know, look at that face. <laughs> it's always nice when you turn, <laughs> um, turn around and sell this to this person for $20 a pill then this person will turn around on the streets and tell it for $40 a pill. The hard thing is, this is all trafficking. When this person decides to sell the pills for $10 pill because it started off at some sort of poverty level, and it goes to this person, they decide to sell it for $20 a pill, and turn around and sell it for $40 a pill. This is all trafficking. And one thing that we realized, one thing we've realized a long time ago is, we're not gonna be able to rest our way out of this problem. This has a multifaceted approach that sort of comes to this. We, one of the reasons why I'm out here today is an education piece. Because I want you guys to be able to leave here and have a vernacular that you have an understanding of what's sort of going on. When you're working with people that have addictions and you have working with people, I want you to have a working knowledge of what they're sort of dealing with. And understand, it's part of a four-pillared approach to trying to deal with this problem. And I'll tell you, it will be a community solution that comes along with this. This has nothing with the police won't have the ultimate answer to it. Nobody has the ultimate answer. It's a community solution that comes up with this. So with Oxycontin, we started seeing this. We started seeing the tears of, uh, tears of dealers. Oxycontin's actually been around for a while. 1916 is when it came around. And German scientists came up with it because people were dying of morphine sticks on the battlefield. When they started in the World War, they started hitting themselves with morphine when they are shot. People started getting infections, so they came up with an oral route for medication. Left alone for a long time until Purdue Pharma came up with the cotton route. Cotton is just the method in which they have in which the drug enters your body. That's it. It's oxycodone. Oxycontin is the name of the drug. And it's just the method that comes into your body. Oxycontin became very popular. Part of the reason was Purdue Pharma listed on the side of their product, do not crush, do not snort, do not inhale, do not. They gave the laundry list of what different ways to abuse their product. So they turned around and they said, okay, we're going to introduce Oxyneo. Oxyneo came along and all Oxyneo was they just put a polymer into Oxycontin. So the old formula was crushed. Looks like uh, the one on, I always do this, on, my, on your left side, my right side, uh, looks like a powder. When it's put into a grinder, it looks very similar as a powder. And finally, when it's mixed with uh, the old formula, mixed with water, looks like that. Very easily to put into your vein or artery, but I'll tell you now what they like doing is like to like. What they like doing is taking, extracting their own blood, putting it down, and putting back in. And the reason they do that is it's easier on your body to process that way if it's blood as opposed to water, which causes sometimes welts to show up. If you see those people kind of with those big sort of exposed sores, sometimes it's water that's sort of pushing out from their body that's caused that. Secondly, new formula crushed, kind of looks like that, a little bit like gravel, put into a grinder like that. And finally, when mixed with the formula, comes as a gelatin. This was a good idea, but the problem was 
They released it two years earlier in the States. So anybody with a cell phone or a smartphone that was told to send messages to their friends, who actually sent the message? Quick, uh, oh, look at that, show of hands, eh? You know what, it's always like elementary school, eh? Somebody asks a question, we're always popping our hands up when we sort of have the right answer. Um, Somebody by the name of Rourke came up with the Rourke method for defeating it. It's a simple 14-step process that involves you putting that pill into a microwave, turning it golden brown, putting it into a freezer, putting it back into a microwave, basically breaking gelatin, the gelatin form to a point where you can actually put it into your veins or arteries. Then somebody took something very similar, and who's ever dropped a penny into Coke, a Coke can? It comes out really shiny, gets burned by the acids, everything like that. If you do something to the Rourke method, that's very simple to oxygen, when you drop in a Coke can, they get a thing called a sludge and they start drinking it that way. So they start getting some lingually as well through there. Big problem is, people that intravenously started using this drug, you take something super hot and you put it into your, into your veins or arteries and you put it into something super cool, it turns back into a gel. People started getting blood clots. We started noticing this that happened in the emergency departments in London, Ontario. Um, IV drug users, it wasn't properly broken down. As well, the patent expired. Actually, first of all, BRAT9 came along. If you need to search any of your kids' search functions, or you're ever coming along with anybody that sort of is abusing, has an octopot or uh, opioid dependence disorder, or anything along those lines, BRAT, if you start seeing that, BRAT9 came up with a simple eight-step process of breaking down oxyneo. Well, improve on a system, right? You can build a better mousetrap. Finally, the patent expired and we started getting generic Oxycontin. Generic Oxycontin came aboard and there were six companies that actually had a patent. There's only three right now that I know of that are still doing it. Apotec in, from Brampton does it. They uh, put two different uh, varieties in as well, a 15 milligram one and a 60 milligram one, and as well, Cobalt Pharmaceuticals is another one that does it. Basically, these don't have the abuse deterrent formula in it. OxyNeo has the abuse deterrent formula that the gel we talked about that goes through, you can't make something abuse proof. If you made something abuse proof, your body would never be able to process it. Because your body has to be able to get that medication at some point, or those narcotics. So finally, genetic uh, oxycontin came on. If you ever hear the people use the term crushables, crushies, or anything along those lines, that's what they're talking about. Something that could still be crushed down. Fentanyl. So, fentanyl, 100 times more powerful now than morphine. Oxycontin, 2.5 times as powerful. Fentanyl came out, it's 100 times as powerful. When it first came out, it was test marketed in San Francisco, and 34 people died with needles in their arm that year. Came out as transdermal patch. What I mean by transdermal is, we didn't talk about that with the Roots Administration, it goes through the skin. When they first put the patch out, it had a huge reservoir of the drug that was available. So people that wanted to get the drug just simply stuck a needle in, pulled the stuff out, and put it right into their arm. Finally, the makers put it into a matrix patching, which sort of interwaves itself right through the patch. On the street, when it was tested in San Francisco that summer, 34 people died with needles in their arms. There was actually a coalition of doctors that tried to stop having general practitioners have fentanyl come out. But it was viewed as a very safe way of doing it, because part of it is, anybody with a throat injury or somebody with a, a chest injury that might be irritated by taking some sort of pill, well, they had something you could place on their shoulder or a sleeve on a large body part to be able to process an opioid to have them a pain relief. First came out for people with quadruple heart bypass surgery because the one thing that fentanyl doesn't affect is your heartbeat. So a lot of times when you see somebody start an overdose, those people partying with them will check their heart and go, they're okay. The heart's the last thing to stop. The air's already stopping. The artificial respiration is what's, their uh, airways are starting to close off. On the street, fentanyl patches are known as patch, sticky, sticker. Um, on the street, the prices can be four, one to four dollars a microgram. So a patch in Sarnia, Ontario can go as high as $400 a patch. We turned around and we looked at the problem and we started seeing this, counterfeit Oxycontin that came through. The first time we found about Oxy, um, counterfeit Oxycontin was in Montreal, Quebec. What happened was, some guy showed up at a UPS store and with a box, a microwave box, turned around and said, hey, can you ship this to Utah? The person from behind the desk took it, turned around, dropped the box, and a whole bunch of pills spilled out. So instead of being like myself that would have worked at the UPS store, taped that up, say it happened to the American side, that person picked up the phone, phoned the police. Police show up, and we saw pills that way. We always thought one thing, ecstasy. Actually, is a party drug that comes along. Basically, what it is is stimulant. It uh, 
causes your tactile senses to overload. So you'll start touching stuff, it'll feel really... So the officers doing a search warrant at the apartment thought they were coming across uh, ecstasy. So it was hot. It was the summertime. They start touching their faces. They start touching their... Travels transdermally. So they started getting some stuff in their eyes. And they started getting some stuff in their mind. And they went to the hospital that night, and they're monitored because they started overdosing. Some of them felt faint. Some of them felt these types of things. Just so you know, no first responder has died from a uh, fentanyl overdose. Part of it is personal protection. We talk about personal protection, gloves. You want to make sure you're gloved, touching any sort of pill. It doesn't matter if you think you know what that pill is. If you reach down to grab a pill, put a glove on. You don't have, no, have any idea how it's made. Uh, when counterfeit Oxycontin came out on the streets, the people with pill presses came it out with and first came out as jade in color. Everybody's seen a jade dragon, right? That kind of speckled green and darker green that sort of goes through. And if you broke the pills open, they're jade all the way through. As it's gotten along, the people that made these fentanyl pills have actually made it better. It's actually white in the center now and green on the exterior. Um, when they first came out in Calgary, they are selling them for as cheap as $10 a pill. And it was cut with fentanyl. So these people that were using, ingesting these pills, were thinking they were taking, had an opioid tolerance that was 2.5 times as powerful as morphine, where it's all of a sudden taking a product that was 40 times as powerful as that. Can you imagine the experience that they had? So BC, Alberta started seeing these spikes of people that ingested uh, more uh, Oxycontin. So fentanyl powder, fentanyl powder is a white, odorless, tasteless, sort of crystallized powder that can come in. Two milligram, micrograms of this stuff is lethal. Basically, almost like the head of a pin, like 16 grains of salt, if you can imagine. That's pure. And I'll be quite honest, you will not see pure cut on the street. Why? Because people take pure material, you don't want to see people die. But People that wanted to cut it into more traditional medication or traditional illicit products started to do that. Cocaine first came out. When cocaine first came out, it came out as an eye surgery medication. They used it as a numbing effect on the eye, and they used to do surgeries that way. They found out later on it was a powerful stimulant. People started taking it illicitly. So people from organized crime cut fentanyl into cocaine because it masks it. That, that numbing sensation that people feel, they sort of have that and then it kicks in even more. Fentanyl is cheaper than cocaine, so it makes their products seem that much more powerful. Um, we saw 30 hours in Durham region, four people became unresponsive from snorting cocaine. Heroin mixed with fentanyl. Heroin is four times as powerful as morphine. They'll cut it with fentanyl because it becomes 25 times more powerful than that. So you turn around, and heroin is that much stronger. Um, how prevalent is that? January, last year. Three people overdosed in Owen Sound, Ontario. Everyone knows where Owen Sound is, right? The home of the attack, kind of up Gray County area of Ontario. Three people overdosed that weekend, same weekend, because it was heroin cut with fentanyl. Some of these people have addictions, and these people need to sort of be treated, but as well, they're dealing with illicit products. When the chief says, know where your source is coming from, or know what you're taking in, this is part of it. People have no idea anymore what's taking in, because it's color, it's tasteless, and it's being cut into traditional products to make it more powerful. Fentanyl labs in Canada. The first fentanyl lab we found out about was in Burnaby, BC. The reason is, guy burned his house down. Now, I'd like to say we're always good at policing, but sometimes we just get lucky. Um, so that happened, and we found out there was a fentanyl that was, lab was going. He didn't have a whole bunch of experience with chemicals. We jump ahead to 2000, 2015, August. Some guy in Dorval, Quebec, decides not to pay his rent. His landlord walks in, two months in arrears, chemical place. Turns around, sees a whole bunch of pill presses printing out these fake Oxycontin illicit 80s that are coming through. We go through, officers of special training go through, they find the man gets arrested. He actually had a biochemistry degree from Bishop's University. He had a recipe book of different drugs he was making and a majority of them were fentanyl pills that he was putting out. We say that you can order things from online. You can get these things from China, Eastern Europe, or anything along those lines, but you can also get it from here. People are starting to make it here as well. Dorval, guy didn't pay his rent. Again, good police work, but sometimes we get lucky too. We're getting a lot better at tracking down some of the chemicals that come out there, but start noticing that if people are sort of, uh, 
people are starting taking pills or taking powders or anything like that, have conversations with them to know what they're taking. So illicit labs are showing up. Fentanyl, the patch, somebody in Ottawa came up with a really smart idea. There was a teenager that overdosed in Manitick, Ontario, which is a bedroom community of Ottawa. The pharmacist there found out the kid overdosed by a fentanyl patch. What happened is the big dealer in that area decided to, he couldn't get Oxycontin anymore, but got a prescription for fentanyl and started giving that out to the kids. Kid died. The pharmacist turned around and said, hey, why can't people just return these things? Because a fentanyl patch is the one thing that has a remainder when it's left over. You take an Oxycontin pill, it's gone. But, because your body processes it, but you take a fentanyl patch, there's still a remainder. So that pharmacist turned around and said, I'm going to have people return my patches. They liked that idea so much, they went to uh, North Bay, took up that idea and said, hey, let's do this for our whole town. Because they had an alarming amount of overdoses that were happening due to fentanyl. Finally, with the OPP, we grabbed that opportunity and that idea and we went across the province with it. OACP picked it up as well. Vic Fidelli from North Bay put it as a law. So now in Ontario, Bill 33 says it's a law. If you get a fentanyl patch, you have to return that fentanyl patch. The one thing we started seeing come along is fake fentanyl patches. That thing on your left, notice I didn't even have to turn it face the screen that time, I'm getting a little bit better that way. Uh, on the left, that's a piece of tape that somebody's returned. The second one is a fake fentanyl patch. Fentanyl patches still have a lot of active ingredient after the three-day use. When you take a fentanyl patch, it's supposed to last you 72 hours. Slowly release through your system. People that compromise these patches cut into it, compromise the matrix, fentanyl actually leases off the side. And actually, what they like doing is they like ingesting it. They like placing it on a tin, food, uh, tin foil spoon, they'll light it up, and it comes up as a fine blue mist. Who's ever burned incense in their life? I'm not gonna ask you the reasons why you burned incense, but uh, you burned incense, that's okay. Uh, comes up as a fine blue mist. And the reason we know this is we're doing a project called Project Daisy. Now, in the OPP, I'd like to say we call things by really tough names. Project Hawk or Project Bear? No, we call it Project Daisy. I'll tell you that story another time if you ever ask me the reason why, but it had to do with the person's identification. We shut that project down. The reason we shut it down is one of the people jumped in the back of our undercover operator's truck, lit up a fentanyl patch, and that person to this day will tell me that their hands started turning black. Because fentanyl, when it starts going through your system, who's ever not worn gloves on a winter's day? And sort of looked and you saw your fingertips were kind of turning that blue bluish shade, cyanosis is what it's called. That started to happen to that person immediately. That person got dropped off to the Berry Hospital, uh, basically sort of got taken through the procedure. We shut it down at that point because of how dangerous that drug is. Uh, fentanyl patches, they like to burn it. And can you imagine the plastics and all those types of things that come up as well and when they're sort of ingesting it? That's one of the things that we see with uh, fentanyl patches. Then we started to notice synthetic opioids. First of all was carfentanyl. Uh, been added to Schedule 1 of the CDSA. Uh, carfentanil now is 10,000 times as potent as, uh, as morphine. This is an animal, this is used for large animals. The one human contact we had before all the th carfentanil pills happened was a zookeeper in Cincinnati, Ohio, decided to try to hit his elephant to be able to uh, cause an anesthetic, go toward the elephant hit a rusty pole instead and sprayed the carfentanil straight in his eyes. He ended up going to the hospital that night. He was fine. But carfentanil was never meant for human consumption. It was always meant for large animals. It was meant for these types of things. So all of a sudden, people saw that this drug was available, and they started putting it into a pill form. They started cutting it with the fentanyl because it would be more powerful. Um, so as you can see, Two milligrams next to a penny, that's how big two milligrams is. That would kill somebody that's probably 180 pounds. Carfentanil is incredibly dangerous. It was being shipped over from China, and it's always this more powerful form of fentanyl. But as well, there's a whole bunch of analogs. There's a whole bunch of opioids that were never classified by Health Canada because they're never meant for human consumption. Sufentanil came out. Sufentanil, Sufenta, basically five to 10 times as powerful as morphine or fentanyl. Basically, the reason it came out, again, for using it for bulls. Can you imagine castration of bulls or anything along those lines? It's a way to sort of anesthetize them. That's a way that this sort of came out. Again, something powerful that people sort of order. And these are all the synthetic opioids that we've classified so far. When you see a synthetic opioids, all these are, are patent numbers. You guys can see that it has a 
two letters and then a number after it. The two letters identifies the pharmaceutical company that produced it. So AH7921, which we've seen in York region of Ontario, uh, it's basically a drug that was invented in the 70s, tested out, had a very low therapeutic value, very high addictive level. So the company never produced it because you have to have a therapeutic level to sort of go along if it has some sort of addiction along with it. So they shelved it. And that was Alan Hanbury's that came up with it. So this patent was sitting there for this, this opioid that was left alone since the 70s. Then people decided to get illicitly and start putting it into pill form or anything to sort of uh, supplement what we already had with prescription pills that came along. We saw U77891, which was the Upjohn company, came up with an opioid. Opioids simply just go onto your opioid receptors, and all they do is depress your pain system. They want you not to experience pain. The World Health Organization labeled pain as one of the commodities of life, basically, and the doctors and physicians tried to deal with that. Now, pain is a very un empirical method that you do it. If I step on this person's foot, I turn around and say, hey, a scale out of 1 to 10, how much does that hurt? This person may say a 2, because she's tough. I may step on, let's see, I'm not going <laughs> to, I may step on my own foot. Let's see, you didn't see that happening. <laughs> I may step on my own foot, or I may step on somebody else's foot, and that person may say, hey, that's a 10 out of 10. Pain is a very personal thing, and as well, it's very hard to empirically measure. It's not like blood pressure or basically heartbeat or anything along those lines. It's very hard. So a bunch of opioids were tried out. And a bunch of these opioids found to have very little therapeutic value and had a high addictive level. So there's shelves. So what people are taking now is they're taking these patents of these opioids and putting it into pills or putting it into powders and cutting it with traditional products. Who, everybody heard about W18, right? Every, W18 came along and had a splash in the paper there. W18 was, came out in University of Alberta. They meant it for large bulls that sort of came along. Um, taken by illicit, taken in Alberta, put out into the community, into a pill form, and overdoses started happening. All these are is patent numbers with opioids that were never really tested for human. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to catch up to it. Because any one of these drugs up to a certain while ago, any one of us could have had a kilogram of this stuff and nobody could have been charged. What we're trying to come up with now is an analog law that basically says if it walks like a duck, it acts like a duck, it is a duck. So any one of these products will eventually be scheduled to the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act under Schedule 1. Methadone. Methadone is a really dirty drug. And the reason I say that, I think methadone treatment, the people that take it and the people that get psychological treatment to deal with the addiction as well, is a great way for people to do it. It acts for 24 hours. The reason why I say it's a really diverted, uh, disgusting drug, I was working the Tory Stafford case in Woodstock, Ontario, and I decided to eat my lunch one day in the park, and looking across from the park was the pharmacy that dispensed methadone. Now, I don't make great life choices because I was sitting there watching, and somebody was sort of coming along with five bucks, and their mouth was kind of, kind of open. There was a person that left the pharmacy, grabbed the five bucks from them, spit that methadone into their mouth. That's the way it was diverted. Lasts 24 hours. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, cutting through an alleyway to get to my car, because again, I make good life choices when it comes to things like that. And I see a gentleman that's sort of bent over like this, starting to squeeze something out into a two liter pop bottle. And I went, hold on, what's going on? He freaked out, I kind of, listen, I don't even know what's going on right now, how about we just talk? So he goes, okay. So I'd gone down to Essex County, Windsor area, and told the pharmacist about the way they're diverting methadone. So he said, what we do now is we take a tampon, we cut off the string up the end, we put the tampon on our side of mouth, we drink the methadone down, we show that, and we take it outside and we squeeze into a bottle, and then we turn around and we sell that bottle. This is the way methadone is diverted. Methadone itself, oh, I jumped ahead. Methadone by itself is part of a treatment program for opioids. The reason why it's effective, it lasts 24 hours. It's supposed to help people with their craving that they have for opioids, but sometimes it's one of the widely abused drugs as well. Sesame. Sesame is a Schedule II drug. Schedule II drugs tend to be ones that deal with cannabis products. The reason why sesame is important, um, start off with, it's very important for PTSD. It's nabilone along those lines. Very hard if people have psychotic conditions. But this is the one that started up medical marijuana. The reason medical marijuana started up, because somebody turned around and said, if I could take this in a pill form, how come I can't just inhale it as an organic? This started up all the medical marijuana. I'll tell you something, though. I'm not going to talk tonight about medical marijuana. That's uh, something, a topic for another time. 
but synthetic marijuana I'll take a chance with. Synthetic marijuana, we just talked about all those precursor chemicals that happen that weren't scheduled. So what people have taken, there was a gentleman by the name of Adam Wookie in Hamilton, Ontario, and he got charged. It was a whole bunch of psychotropic drugs that people took and they sprayed on green light food material and he started putting in the love shop and he started putting in these different head shops. And on the back of these things, it said not for human consumption, plant food. Well, anybody with a Timmy's cup can plant that into a ground and technically it's plant food. These drugs found to have very little therapeutic value, so these chemicals were left away. People have taken them now and put them onto green leafy material and caused people to smoke. The only overdoses I've ever seen, deaths that have happened due to marijuana or anything along those lines, is synthetics. So, start taking a look. If your kids are talking about K2, spice, anything along those lines, synthetic marijuana. Because it's psychotropic chemicals that you don't really have an idea of exactly how it's going to act. Man, I'm flipping ahead. To the people at Rogers, I apologize about that. I was jumping ahead on you. Schedule three. Schedule three are your stimulants. So drugs do one of two things. They either excite a system or they depress a system. Prescription drugs. Ritalin on the street, known as a poor man's crack cocaine. Um, Ritalin came along because a biochemist wanted his wife to be able to play tennis with him, and she had low blood pressure. So he came up with this drug to be able to increase her blood pressure. In the 1950s, and you had to be in the 1950s because we'd never let a test like this go on, they took a bunch of kids that had focus disorders or ADHD and they put a whole bunch of chemicals at them. And they found out Ritalin kind of burns out these kids. The easiest way we see Ritalin abused is you take your kid, you give him a can of Coke and you send him to school that day. You do that for two weeks. That kid is off the charts, right? Not acting, not focusing, not anything along those lines. All of a sudden turns around, Teacher sees it, school psychologist gets called in, school psychologist sees about 400 kids a day, turns around and goes, that's sort of ADHD. The kid gets, that reference gets taken to the school or to the general practitioner, or maybe it just goes to the general practitioner. GP writes a prescription for Ritalin or Concerta. People take the kids off the coke and they have a drug that's abused on the streets. $7 a pill. Now, I will tell you, I've had two criminal informants both die 34 years of age. Reason they died? quadruple heart bypass surgery, their uh, vein and arteries around their heart exploded. The reason is, when we are younger, we burn things off. Heck, when I was in high school, I could eat a Big Mac and run 100 meters. Uh, if I eat a Big Mac now, I'm down for like three days. Like the meat sweats, I got everything going on. As we're adults, we tend to hold on to things a lot longer. So it with uh, Ritalin, it builds up around your heart and it expands those blood vessels to the point where it sort of explodes. These are the people you'll see on the streets who go, man, these people are really agitated, really jumpy, but I'll tell you, they have the best set of choppers going. When you take meth or you take cocaine or anything along those lines, what it does is it leaches the calcium out of your body used towards the ion channels to actually make it more effective. Ritalin has a little bit of that in there. So it's already built up. These people have great teeth. So if you're dealing with people that may seem like they're on a drug, very excitable, very, it might be Ritalin that they're on. The Veld Festival in Toronto, we saw three, two precursor drugs come along. Ethylphenidate, which is a precursor of methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, and methylbesylpiprazine. The, the drug dealers in there wanted to come up with a party drug. So what they took, they took these precursors to these drugs and put them out into capsules. As you can see, ethylphenidate has the same thing as crack cocaine is the effects. The exact same effects. Two kids overdosed at that festival. Both had somewhat of heart conditions that come along, but as well, they took mitfuls of this drug and basically overstimulated their system. Depressants, schedule four. Benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines came along. Benzodiazepines have like a zero lethality rate. My pharmacology prof used to say the only reason you get killed by Xanax is you got hit by the truck delivering it. You can see all the different disorders it's used for. Lazepam, Barazepam, Clazepam, all the Pams and Lambs. Anxiety disorder, panic disorders, insomnia, anything along those lines. Zero lethality rate. But people start abusing this. It's now Schedule 4. So if the police come across you with Schedule 4 drugs, they'll come up and they'll show it to them. We can't arrest you because possession is no longer an issue. But we can turn around and say, you should show me that authorization for that pill because you need to be authorized to have that pill. And if not, then that, chances are that's stolen property. So we might achieve that as possession of stolen property or anything like that, because actually 
benzodiazepines can be a very dangerous drug. When mixed with alcohol, it jumps up to a 75% lethality rate because it causes people to be super drunk. It causes people to have their respiratory system to sort of shut down. Mixed with opioids, jumps up to 80%. So those people, a lot of times when we come out to death scenes now that has benzodiazepines or anything like that, it's mixed with alcohol. You see the 40 ounce of alcohol that's kind of out there. So these are very dangerous drugs. Steroids. This is Mark McGuire when he started off his career. He actually played for the Calgary Cannons. Uh, this is Mark McGuire when he ended his career. I can tell you one thing. I'm 40. It hurts every time I say that now. I'm 40. <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. Um, my muscles have not grown bigger. I go to the gym every day. I know it's right by the Timmy's where I go to work. And I can tell you that's something that sort of happened. I need to include the picture of Mark McGuire now because what happens is he kind of looks like a shriveled br prune because his body doesn't produce testosterone anymore. And the reason I bring steroids up, because <coughs> sometimes when we talk about drug abuse, we're always talking about the lowest low, right? We're looking at that kid that's not attending school or not doing anything. This will be a varsity athletes. This will be those types of things. Ritalin. The most popular places where Ritalin's abused? Major colleges, major universities, because it causes people to focus in, it causes people to sort of, causes people to sort of ultra focus on their studies. So we see it with a lot of with the people that are studying to be physicians or anything along those lines. So steroids. Steroids, people start introducing, kids start introducing things to their body that their body is not used to. All of a sudden, their muscles grow, but their heart really hasn't grown. So it causes heart problems, causes those types of things. Fake lifestyle drugs. Who's seen a good Viagra commercial lately? Viagra sort of came out. It started off, and the reason I bring this up is we're getting to prom time, right? And kids see those commercials. Watching the Super Bowl, there's always that commercial where the parents are showing the kids with the headphones on or giving them the headphones where they go upstairs for a few minutes or whatever. Fake lifestyle drugs. Who's gotten one of those emails that have come in? Hey, have you, like, it's always in your junk. If you ever look in your junk, it's always there. Fake lifestyle drugs. It started off in England. Sandwich England, and a whole bunch of people were trying out a heart medication, and a bunch of older gentlemen said, ah, it doesn't really do much to affect my heart, but I'll tell you what it does affect. So Pfizer put it as erectile dysfunction medication. The reason I bring this up is, sometimes people buy this online, and sometimes kids try this from the local, local, uh, local variety store along those lines. And we actually did a project with the Ministry of Finance, and we actually seized uh, some of the pills that came along. And we had tested out for Viagra, and as you can see, the fake Viagra had antibiotics in it, amphetamines, and as well, printer ink, blue printer ink to make it that blue color. Can you know how poisonous printer ink is? So, next time a buddy of yours is saying, hey, I can get this cut Viagra, or you see your kids holding onto these blue pills, because guess what? They get educated on this stuff. They sort of find out about this. Take a look, and if it's any time, so as the chief said, if you don't know where your source is, where it's coming from, you have to be really worried about counterfeit drugs. Packaging of Oxycontin is what we see, or any other prescription drugs. When they come out from a pharmacy, when it's uh, Shoppage Drug Mark, Loblaws tends to be amber in color. Rexall tends to be blue in color. Costco tends to be clear in color. This was a warrant we did. As you can see, this gentleman has no problem showing us off all the uh, legal medications he has. And this is what we start seeing. First of all, if you come across a prescription bottle without uh, any prescription on it, you have no idea who's authorized to have that. That prescription bottle should have a name on it, type of drug, should have uh, the usage that that person's supposed to use. When we start seeing uh, labels ripped off, we think diversion, or we think possibly trafficking along those lines. We know we can't clarify who is supposed to have that prescription. Um, very dangerous, very dangerous to try. Sometimes it's uh, exposed medication. Sometimes it's not even the right medication that's in that bottle. As well, we have ways of tracking. I'm not going to sort of disclose those now, but we have ways of finding out. And if this person turns around and sold her drugs to this person, and this person didn't rip the label off just right, we could still track it down to this person. So those types of things happen. As well, that person had all their drugs on the counter, so why is he keeping a bottle of Oxycontin in the lower left corner in your sock drawer? I can have, tell you having two boys, if I'm ever looking for something that's been squirreled away, uh, the sock drawer is where I go. Because... Uh, that's secret of behavior. And if you're dealing with people that have addictions or anything along those lines, those people have squirreled away to some point. And you got to wonder why these people have secret of behavior. And sometimes it's not even what you think. Sometimes it could have been that person, that house is having somebody else abuse their drugs. So ask those questions. Take the time to ask that of people that sort of have that. Find out the reason why that's secret behavior. Maybe they are 
having an addiction. Maybe they have something along that lines, or maybe they are taking it away from somebody who has addiction. If they're an elderly person, talk to them about having medication safe. Talk to them about talking to people that have their drugs. Finally, Ziploc baggies. That was found. I can tell you, uh, the Drug and Pharmacy Act says that all pharmaceutical drugs must be in a childproof container. I can tell you, a two-year-old worth their salt can get fishy crackers out of uh, out of a Ziploc baggie, no problems at all. The reason why they have them in Ziploc baggies, quite honestly, every time I see this is trafficking. Why? Because it's easy. Because you can turn around and you reach in your pocket and you can go like this with the pills and you can go off or you can go with this with anything sort of along those lines to pass off. Because it really is hard when all of a sudden you're taking that bottle and you're trying to line up the arrows as you possibly can as you're trying to, I don't know if this person's a police officer is here, I don't know if this person's going to jump me for that. So then I could take the time to sort of take the pill bottle and line up the arrows, pop off the top, go, how many do you want? Two? Okay, no problem. Dispense it that way. That's not the way the world works. And they're very quick transactions. So anybody that's keeping in plastic baggies, very concerning behavior. Street prices. RCMP puts out street prices. Don't take your time to shut this down. Don't worry about that. Uh, different police services put out the street prices. That's available. All the street prices I gave you today are on a site called StreetRx. StreetRx is a, a site came up by a doctor by the name of Richard Dart. Richard Dart is a man from Colorado that had a bunch of graduate students that turned around and said, this social media thing is kind of cool. So let me tell you, so how do we reach out to people to find out what they're kind of abusing. What they did is they came up with a map of the states, then a map of Canada. And what this does is allows people to put on their street prices that they paid for some of the drugs. Why? Because some of these people are disenfranchised. They just want something to know. They want to know that if they're paying for something, they're not getting ripped off. But as well, this is a way they reach out to members of their community. They sit back. But as for what's interesting for us is you can put that on any one of the pins that happen across that map, and you can see the last 10 drugs sold in that area. And you can see the problems. When we did Barry, we saw seven out of the last 10 was all fentanyl products that were sold. London, at one point, had six out of the top 10 were all methylphenate Ritalin that was sold. So get familiar with your area. If you're saying that you have a drug problem, take a look at your area to find out what's sort of going on. I can tell you as well, looking at some of the prices, uh, the person that paid $5 for an Oxycontin 20 tablet uh, got a pretty good price. The person that paid 25 bucks and for a five milligram one got ripped off. But some of these people, they're disenfranchised. They want a way to reach out to their community because their community's hard, right? They might go down to a local coffee shop where it has, but they're trying to understand. This is a great way for you if you're dealing with people in the addictions community or anything along those lines to see what people are placing down, see what people are selling, see what people are buying that way. Methods of prescription drug diversion or drug diversion forward scripts are always going to be there. I'm sort of checking my time for a minute, sorry. How am I doing now? Uh, forged prescriptions are always there. What do you have to worry about with forged prescriptions are? Personal people's identification. We're all captured on the Ontario Narcotic Monitoring System. The Ontario Mar Narcotic Monitoring System comes up and we all have drugs that are based on that. Schedule war, one to four drugs are captured on that. We cite a lot of uh, identity fraud and those types of issues coming up with forged prescriptions. Um, we see a lot of doctors have forged prescriptions as well. Sometimes we see doctors that have written prescriptions that they didn't want to write. Because I'll tell you, what's a hard thing? When you're a doctor and somebody that's twice your size walks into that room and turns around and says, you're gonna write that script or I'm gonna break your arm. It's a very hard thing for that doctor to turn around and say, I'm not gonna write that script. I do a lot of talks with doctors and I tell them, if you gotta write that script, you gotta write that script. Because you wanna get out there. Because we can replace drugs, but we can't replace you. Um, forged scripts come up all the time. If you ever hear of somebody using forged scripts or anything along those lines, contact Crime Stalkers, contact your local police. If you're part of the pharmacy community, you're able to report that to police. Double doctoring. Double doctoring is simply two doctors. It's against schedule, uh, it's a charge under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. Part of it is personal protection. If you get a prescription for opioids or a Schedule One drug from one doctor, then two days later you go see another doctor for a prescription from Schedule One, that's double doctoring if you haven't told the second doctor about the original doctor's prescription. Part of the reason we have that law is protection of society. We don't want to see a whole bunch of people overdosing because they have an addiction that sort of goes along those lines. But as well, we don't want to see a glut of these pharmaceuticals get out into the communities to allow people to search traffic that way. So double doctoring. Internal diversion. Internal diversion is happening more often than we care to know. Um, 
internal diversion, sometimes it's quite simply as somebody has returned a whole bunch of products to a pharmacy and somebody takes those Oxycontin tablets and places it in their pocket. Um, another case that happened in London, Ontario, uh, the pharmacy tech, well, what happened is a 73-year-old lady turns into, uh, comes into the pharmacy complaining about the fact that it doesn't seem like her liquid hydromorphone is actually causing the effect that she actually wanted to have. So, pharmacist thinks that's kind of weird because she's been on it for a number of years. Well, he decides to change the vault number of their narcotics. One of his workers comes in the next day and goes, hey boss, the uh, narcotics vault number has changed. Yeah, sure enough, he sets up a camera. He sees that employee go that night, take a syringe, take out the liquid hydromorphone and replace it with water. Now, two things could have happened from that. Say that pharmacist contacted the doctor and said, hey, can we up this person's dose for it to be a level? That person could have overdosed if that person didn't take the water out or put the water in. As well, there's a vial of liquid hydromorphone that's actually on the streets of London. Internal diversion happened a number of different ways. Sometimes we've seen cases that happen in old, uh, in long-term care homes where they'll uh, target people that have dementia or Alzheimer's and they'll take the fentanyl patches off them because they can't say anything. And they'll place it upon tensor bandages so it doesn't touch their skin. Or they'll see medications go missing from different schedules. As well, sometimes it's people that are taking care of the elderly. They'll just, hey, I'm not going to give them a dose today. They're not going to tell anybody because some of those people are really isolated. So those people right now that are in our, in our audience today that are working with some of the elderly in that, take your time to talk to them about medication. Make sure that they're taking them. Make sure that they have a pill schedule. Make sure they have a way of counting it up to make sure it's there. Um, reported thefts and break and enters are happening more and more. Um, part of it is it's worth something on the street. The other thing is it's an easy target, pharmacies. Um, break and enters happen all the time. If you have a pharmacy or you know anything, we have uh, officers in our community that actually help you with community design of the actual pharmacies to assist with any of the break and enters that happen. And as well, if you're working at a pharmacy, you know a pharmacist, tell them to take a dummy bottle of Oxycontin, fill it with a whole bunch of vitamin C. Uh, we've done that with different pharmacies that we've come across. And I'll tell you, when that person comes in with a note saying, give me all your Oxycontin, and you give them that bottle, that person's gone two blocks before they realize they don't have the real stuff. And you've had a chance to phone. We do those types of things. We do those types of education as well for pharmacists. And finally, online is a way that we see it. This is my favorite ad of all time. Uh, I do searches on Craigslist every once in a while, not for what you think I do searches on Craigslist for. <laughs> I put in terms such as Oxy 420, anything along those lines. This is my favorite one I found in Milton, Ontario. Oxy for sale. I have eight pills for sale, five bucks for each, 30 for all eight. I love this next part. Person's totally honest. Need to buy booze and smokes for tonight. It, then the person gets super genteel when they say, hey, if you could meet me at Dairy Trudeau tonight before 10, that'd be preferred. I'm like, wow, if somebody's going through Dairy and Trudeau at that point, would have had a drug deal going down. But as well, if you have other people using your computer and you suspect these people might be abusing drugs or anything like that, start doing the searches for that type of stuff. Start seeing if they're looking for 420 marijuana, if they're looking for Oxy, if they're looking for Molly, if they're looking for these different types of things, take a look at your browser history. I know that's tough for some people that don't want to show off their browser history, but sometimes it's the important steps that you need to take to protect your own house or you per need to protect your, or your own community. And as I said, this is a community-based problem. This isn't an us-based problem. We're all trying to come up with a solution that sort of comes up to it. The like, way I like, so the other thing is ordering online. We talked about fentanyl, we talked about powder fentanyl, how it comes in. A lot of times it's sent in from China. People go, oh my God, I can't believe it comes in from the, the postal services and that's happening. I'd like to say the postal service, but there's a gentleman that mailed body parts across Canada at one point. I'm not saying it's to blame, but I'm saying we have a lot of mail that goes through our system, right? And to catch everything that comes in is almost unbelievable. People order drugs through. This is a, a place called India Mart. You can order fentanyl patches. You can order all these powder type of fentanyls. Um, if you look at this and you think it's a really good idea, I can tell you that there's an investigation that went on. Um, drug called Atruzin, online pharmacy actually from Canada, actually in Manitoba area. Atruzin was a cancer relief for women with breast cancer. A whole bunch of people decided to cut out the middleman and order it online for cheaper products instead of going to their local pharmacy. Turned out this online pharmacy was taking products from Turkey that had a third of the strength of the actual product. 
So a whole bunch of these women in the States that were ordering from Canadian online pharmacy were actually getting a third of the strength and their cancer was increasing. Just because you're cutting a corner because you think you're cutting, you're cutting down the cost or anything like that, pharmacies are set up for a reason. And we go to them because they're trusted sources, right? We know we're getting the product that we're saying that we're getting. So just know that if you see people going online to order drugs or anything like that, it's a good chance they're not getting it. As well, they could be getting a real product. They could be getting fentanyl patches which they would be abusing or anything along those lines. So it's important to sort of take a look at people's browsing history. I always like ending off my lectures with giving you a last educational. If you come across anybody that has the following signs, pick up the phone, call 911, get yourself involved. We're members of this community. We want to save people in this community. And this is a public safety problem. As I said at the very first slide today, 700 people, 2014, all overdosed. Second leading cause of death in Ontario. First leading cause is falls. And I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to defeat gravity. But I can tell you, we can get behind this opioid overdose as best we can. So, overdose signs you'll see. First thing you'll see, people will start slowing down their breathing. They'll start talking a little bit like they're drunk, but they won't have that alcohol smell. Everybody smelled alcohol, right? Snuck into the house or had a kid sneak into the house and sort of smelled alcohol, sort of coming off their breath. Everybody knows what alcohol smells. They'll have that slower speech and it'll be, they'll seem impaired that way, but they won't have that alcohol smell. The second thing you'll notice is their breathing starts slowing down and they'll start getting the head nods. And you'll hear people in the community that sort of uh, deal with addictions, they'll start talking about the nods. These people that take fentanyl or they take anything like that, they start overdosing, it's the nods. The breathing slows down because that's the first thing to shut down. And finally, if people are sleeping or anything like that, it'll be like a snoring sound they'll hear. And that's basically the respiratory system shutting down. On in Brantford, in EMS, they have a drug called naloxone. Naloxone is going to be expand, explained later on, so I'm not going to be the one to sort of explain naloxone because I see the kit that's here and I don't want to eat somebody else's presentation time. I can tell you, I have a kit in naloxone. Um, Police forces, you're going to hear all sorts of things come from different police forces about naloxone. I'm not going to get into uh, policies or anything regarding naloxone or anything along those lines, but I can tell you any, they'll tell you all about naloxone later. Naloxone will be something that takes people out of the overdose and they'll explain why. Um, you see anybody going through this, the bluing of the fingertips, take that time, phone 911, get somebody involved. Don't just leave that person that seems like they're sleeping on the park bench there if you think there's something going on. We all have that spidey sense, right? That hair is on the back of your neck when something just feels off. You look in the corner of your eye, that doesn't feel right. Take the time. That's the reason why 911 is here, to check up on people. Uh, but they'll be non-responsive. You'll kind of rub their knuckles along their, their chest and they won't respond. Somebody that's drunk, you rub your knuckles across somebody's chest, they are up and they are mad. Like, why would you do that? Um, get involved. Um, overdose signs for a stimulant. These people are talking a mile a minute where they're actually going along and they're actually talking about life. They'll be talking about, oh my God, my kids, I can't believe my, my mortgage and all these everyday things. These are the people that seem to have superhuman strength. They'll be doing push-ups while there's people on top of them or they'll doing, and their body is overstimulated to a point where they have this sort of inhuman strength, but what they're doing is tearing tendons and their body's working up to that point where their heart just goes, I'm out, I can't do this anymore. And basically their heart will stop. If you start seeing people talking a mile a minute or anything along those lines, it could be mental health act, but it could be somebody starting to go through the last day of a stimulant overdose. So it's important to call 911. Finally, one of the rarer ones, but hallucinogen. Um, the reason why this is, this is PCP, LSD, anything along those lines, when people start overdosing on hallucinogens, what they start seeing, these are the people that start seeing the aliens come down. And these are the people that will be talking a mile a minute, but as well, they're really attracted to shiny surfaces or bright objects. Rodney King is a gentleman that the LAPD dealt with, um, was an avid PCP user, talking with the homicide detective that actually investigated his death. He used PCP to the point where your equilibrium screwed up. You don't know what's up and down, and he was an avid swimmer. Had a pool there, jumped in the pool, kept swimming towards the bottom of the pool. We start seeing occurrences now of people that are actually towards lakes at night that are using PCP and see the moon hitting off it and start going towards that, or even worse, dealing with people on the side of the road. When all of a sudden the headlights or anything like that, they'll start darting into the cars or anything like that. You see people with that type of behavior, call 911. Take the time to call. That person is in some sort of distress that sort of goes along. I'm not telling you get out of your car, tell that person to calm down or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with pulling your car over and monitoring at the point. 
Even the same with somebody going over an overdose. Get somebody involved. If you can't get involved because you have some sort of history or you have some sort of, you're not able to physically do it, observe. There's nothing wrong with observing. Stay in your car, observe it. Call 911, make sure we sort of have that. I hope you guys know more about opioids at the end of this lecture and sort of taking some time. This is my contact information. You ever have a question, you have anything like that, that's sort of in the back of your head or anything along those lines? My name's Chris Oje. That's my uh, email. And if it's a real emergency, call 911. If, if you have a question, give me a call on my phone number. Um, the reason I do this is I've been bought into this for a while. I've been doing this for the last, since I got off the Stafford investigation. I know what's happening, I see what's happening, and you know what? It's important that our community gets involved. So anytime you want to sort of talk or you have a community problem, I'll try to do my best to direct you along those lines. But ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation for tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you so much, Chris. Chris truly is the expert and has a lot of knowledge. Uh, we'd like to take a few minutes now for questions. So there is mics um, up here. Um, if folks have questions, we'd invite them to uh, come up to the mic and uh, go ahead and ask questions. I can't see very well. The lights are so bright up here. So maybe folks can put up their hand if they have a question at this time. I'd also like to take a moment um, just before the health unit comes up uh, and does their presentation just to uh, quickly introduce you to the other members um, of our group who are sitting up uh, at the table tonight. So at the far end, you have Shauna and Tin and Ruth. That is our team from the Brant County Health Unit. Uh, Chris has just spoken. Beside Chris is Julie Smith. She's the manager of addictions at St. Leonard's Community Services. Uh, and then, of course, Chief Nelson and uh, myself. Uh, we are also available to ask questions now or uh, answer questions, I should say, now or as the evening goes on. So next presentation is Ruth Gratton. Ruth is the manager of infectious diseases at the Brant County Health Unit, and Ruth is going to talk about harm reduction. Thank you, Anne. Chris, I don't want to have to follow you anymore. You're a hard act to to follow. Oh, I see what you mean. This is very sensitive. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. It's great to see this turnout. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to give a general definition of harm reduction that we have subscribed to, um, and then I'm going to give a brief overview of um, Brant County Health Unit's harm reduction services. Um, that are related specifically to uh, our focus tonight. And then Tin Vo, um, who is a health promoter at the Health Unit, and he works very, very closely with health protection. He's going to speak about the opioid overdoses in Brant. And then following Tin, Shauna Wilson will review with you our package contents um, that we use when we meet with clients who are requesting an naloxone kit. Shauna is a public health nurse at the health unit. Um, she has been instrumental in rolling this program out in our community, and she has done many educational sessions um, out in the community, and maybe some of you have actually been part of those sessions. At the end of the presentations tonight, Shauna and our team members will be able to provide training and naloxone kits for a maximum of 40 people. We will do this in the rehearsal hall immediately after the presentations. Um, anyone who is at risk of an overdose or a family member or a friend that is here tonight are encouraged to join us later for this training. The rehearsal hall is just out through this door um, towards the Darling Street uh, exit. And if we have more than 40, we'll give you our contact information so that you can um, come um, and see us as soon as possible to actually um, get a kit and get the training. Please take advantage of it, though, tonight if you can.
So what is harm reduction? Harm reduction is meeting people where they are at by recognizing that they simply cannot stop engaging in certain act activities like drug use, like smoking, sex, while at the same time providing options to lower the harm associated with their choice of activities. The focus of public health is on the whole population. Our work is embedded in the daily lives of people in Ontario. Public health interventions have made cars that we drive and the food that we eat safer. They have protected us from infectious diseases and environmental threats to our health. These interventions have created healthier environments to support and inform choices about <coughs> risks, including those related to alcohol and tobacco. We need to do more and do it quicker in the area of harm reduction, as we are faced with a looming opioid crisis today. Delivering public health programs and services involves working with multiple sectors within and outside of the health system. We all need to work together as not one entity can, do, can handle this work and it really affects all of us. Work at BCHU is about health promotion and health protection. Our services are very broad and include, as I mentioned, tobacco cessation, treatment for sexually transmitted infections. Um, you know us probably about for our immunization programs in the schools and the health unit clinics, uh, the flu clinics that we have. We've contracted community-based organizations, um, specifically St. Leonard's and Brantford Medical Clinic presently, to provide needle exchange programs. We also participate in the Ontario Naloxone program. Clients at risk of opioid overdose, their friends and family members, and newly released inmates at risk of opioid overdose can all access Naloxone kits. Today, these kits are available at several pharmacies in our community as well, and Six Nations, and also from us at Public Health and through our clinic services. As I mentioned, we will be doing that tonight. This information is on our health unit website and also the Fentanyl Can Kill website. We want to ensure um, that a nurse is actually available for when you come in, so we do um, request that an appointment is made, so please call ahead. Um, and as mentioned, please stay behind for those 40 kits that we hope to um, train and dispense um, tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Tin to talk about our data. So I'm gonna to talk to you about seven numbers up there. The first is um, the number of ER visits that we've had between 2011 and 2015. Um, that was sitting at 294. Um, and that, um, within the city of Brantford, it makes up about 84% of ER, ER visits. And most cases fall between the 15 to 24, 25 to 34, and 45 to 54 age groups. The next number is 129 hospitalizations between 2011 and 2015, and about 78% of cases fall in the city of Brantford. Um, and most cases are within the 25 to 34, 45 to 54, and 55 to 64 age groups. And then in terms of overdose deaths, between 2011 and 2015, we had 47 deaths uh, related to opioids. Um, and that includes hydromorphone and fentanyl. Um, in 2016, um, naloxone kits were being provided by the health unit. And uh, so over the year, 64 kits were provided and five kits were actually used. Um, and we've equated that to five lives saved. <clears throat> and the last two numbers there uh, come from the, Ontar uh, the Ontario Drug Benefit. So we're sitting at about 8,900 um, opioid users um, in 2015, and that number has sort of hovered between 2011 and 2015 at nine, about 8,900, and we're ranked at uh, about fifth in 40, uh, out of 49 regions in Ontario. 
In terms of opioid maintenance therapy, um, we're ranked at uh, six out of the 49 regions, and that number jumps from 390 up to 680 individuals between 2011 and 2015. In terms of our needle exchange program, um, you'll see there in terms of the total visits, it has sort of slowly increased between 2010 and 2016 with a slight drop in 2013 where one of our sites had closed for a few months. And then the number of needles given out uh, between 2010 and 2016 jumped significantly despite the uh, sort of steady increase in total visits. Um, and so that's a number to sort of keep in mind and uh, think about in terms of the uh, drug use that is in our community. So I'm going to turn it over to Shauna. Hello. Okay. So what is naloxone? Naloxone, or Narcan, is also another name for it. Naloxone is a safe antidote to opioid overdose. And I, what I mean by safe is it, there's no side effects and there's no harm done if given. And naloxone takes one to five minutes for, to work. Sorry, I'm not changing the slide. Naloxone takes one to five minutes to work. So when given, it could take one to five minutes for that person to wake up. They could require another dose, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now, what naloxone does is it's a medication that displaces the opioid from the brain receptors. So if somebody is overdosing, naloxone given will pull that opioid off of brain receptors and replace it with itself and wake that person up. Why is it used? Opioid overdose is the leading cause of accidental, accidental death right now. Opioids are the family of pain medication, drugs with a high potential for addiction, and subsequent misuse. Naloxone is not a, the naloxone program is not a new program. It's been around since the 90s. It started in Germany, spread to England, and has traveled worldwide. We just started the program in January of last year. So it's been, is that 15 months? Um, and I've given over 60 kits away. And what I do is we give out kits at the health unit, so you can come to the health unit and be trained and receive a kit. Or I go to the three needle exchange sites in Brantford, and I just sit and wait, and anybody who's interested can get a kit that day. So this is just a picture of what I was talking about, um, somebody overdosing and then naloxone sort of replacing itself on the brain receptors. So the first picture is somebody's overdosing on, on an opioid. Opioids cause pain, relief, pleasure, reward, reward, but they also cause respiratory depression, which is the problem. People can stop breathing if they take too much of an opioid. So what the, the naloxone does when given is it pulls that opioid off of the brain receptor, replaces itself for a temporary period of time, depending on how much opioid that person has take, taken. Sorry, I'm nervous. Depending on how much opioid that person has taken, it can, the naloxone will wear off and the opioid overdose can come back. So this is, what the, this is just a picture of what the kits looked like when we first started handing them out. They were injectable. Um, we gave two doses of naloxone in an ampule in a, in a kit that just was disguised, sort of looked like a sunglasses kit. And in that kit, there were syringes and the injectable naloxone, um, a mouth shield if a person felt like they could do mouth to mouth. And we, we teach basic CPR um, with the training. And then, so that was how the program started. We got the injectable. It's now been replaced by a nasal spray form, which is kind of great. So this spray is just placed in the nair and sprayed, and it's absorbed in the mucosa of the, the nose. I've got a kit here, if anybody's interested. Um, so the, the spray is just that big, and it's just a quick spritz up the nose, and it, it takes the same amount of time as the injectable. We give two doses just in case a person needs a second dose, or if there's two people overdosing, we have two, two doses of the medication. But when I was talking about um, the, op the overdose coming back, if it's been a period of time, 30 to 90 minutes, and that, that opioid starts to sort of, the naloxone is wearing off and the opioid over overdose is coming back, we have a second dose here. But hopefully somebody has called 911 and that the first responders are on their way or already there. So 
just in your family of drugs, we have depressant drugs, stimulant drugs, and hallucinogens. The depressant drugs are the guys that slow down the brain and the nervous system, and you could potentially stop breathing should you take too much. And this is just another, an idea of what drugs fall into that category. So you have your opioids, which are in the red. It's just a small, a, a small amount of drugs, given the amount of drugs that are out on the street. So anything mixed with, with anything else, at least given the naloxone, will pull that opioid off of the brain receptor. It's not going to touch the stimulants that are hallucinogens or alcohol, but it will help with, the, with too much opioid. I have to take a drink. Um, so this is just what I was talking about. Naloxone reverses the effects of the opioids and not any other drugs or alcohol. It doesn't counter the effect of, of anything else besides that opioid. Um, but if, taken, if a person takes a combination of things and they take alcohol on top of it, it will work for that opioid. So if anything, it could get that person breathing again. It won't hurt to administer naloxone. There are no side effects. Uh, many overdoses happen due to mixing the opioids. That's what I was talking about. Um, in the worst case scenario, naloxone will simply do nothing. If it's not an opioid overdose, then it just won't, it won't help. But hopefully somebody has called 911 and the help is on its way. So what is an overdose? It can occur when a person has used too much of one drug or multiple drugs at the same time. The body is not able to withstand that amount of drug in the body. It causes depression of the respiratory system that could lead to eventual death. Um, it can occur suddenly or, or over several hours, and it can happen to anyone. Those who may be at risk for an overdose include people who with, with a reduced tolerance. So if somebody has gone into rehab or gone into hospital or say gone into jail, they've been in there for a period of time without that drug, they come out expecting to use the same amount they're, and they're not able to withstand that because they have that reduced tolerance. So those people are at risk for an overdose. Those who have say, change dealers or they've gone into to um, say they've gone to jail and the, the dealer has gone to jail they come out they expect to find that guy again they can't find him they have to get a new dealer they're now dealing with somebody who they don't know and they don't necessarily know what they're getting so those people are at risk anybody who relies on someone else to inject them so in a say a relationship system if a female can't inject herself and she has her partner inject her she's not sure what she's getting or how much she's getting and then those who use drugs alone. So we always encourage if you're going to use, please tell friends, family, keep your doors open and just let somebody know that you're about to use so that they can check on you should they, should they need to. Um, how would I recognize an overdose? The breathing is slow or absent. There's deep snoring or gurgling. I know Chris went over this. I don't want to repeat it too much. Fingers or nails look purple or blue. The lips, the purple or blue, unresponsive to stimuli, vomiting or loss of consciousness. When in doubt, give naloxone. So this is just part of the training that I do. Um, I teach them quick. So stimulate the person, see if they're awake, see if you can get them to wake up on their own. Immediately call 911. Give naloxone, start chest compressions and rescue breaths if you're comfortable doing that. Check the person, has anything changed? Has that person started breathing again? Again, if not, start all over again, give the second dose of naloxone and hopefully your first responders are there. We just teach them how to place that person in the recovery position if they have started to breathe again. They could still vomit. Um, coming out of an overdose, they could feel drug sick and have the nausea vomiting. They, they'll feel terrible. So just to prevent from, from vomiting, lying on your back, put them in the recovery position. What not to do? I had to add this to the training because of the horror stories that I heard that people were doing prior to giving the, the naloxone program being here. So people were kicking, punching, slapping, burning, um, setting their, their clothes on fire by trying to burn them to wake them up, burning their feet, their testicles, um, putting ice cubes up their rectum, and none of that was working. <laughs> so what we did in here was I just had to say, you're going to do more harm by trying these things. So just get yourself a naloxone kit and give naloxone. And then follow up. It can be traumatic for everybody after an overdose. So see what you can do. See if there's people around you who can support you. Seek support, seek family members, seek help. And make sure that everybody knows around you that you want to get help and get your naloxone kit. And that's it. I, I want to take a moment and say uh, truly how uh, uh, 
the health unit and in particular Ruth and Tin and Shauna truly are partners uh, with us at St. Leonard's um, in, uh, in the harm reduction effort. Um, they, uh, they do provide a lot of support and assistance uh, for us, for our staff, and of course for our clients as well. I uh, want to ask uh, at this time if there's any questions for anybody up here. Um, if there is, please raise your hand. Um, and if not, we are going to move on now. Yes? Yes, uh, I'm uh, wondering about the uh, availability of these uh, naloxone kits. You mentioned about the pharmacies also having there's six of them in town. And I actually talked to Tara Hill, which is one of the uh, pharmacies that does have the naloxone kits there. And they were telling me that the person, when they went in, would have to produce their Ontario health card to obtain the kit. Now, people being people, uh, a little paranoid about producing such documentation, uh, wouldn't you actually feel that would uh, impede the, uh, the people from going and obtaining the kit that they actually do need uh, to protect themselves uh, using different drugs, not just necessarily fentanyl, but there's a lot of drugs. That's how my son died, was he was taking a specific drug that was laced with a deadly dose of fentanyl. He did not even know it was there. Uh, do you not think that producing that health card uh, creates more of a hindrance of people being willing to walk in? Because let's face it, this, this, these drugs, there's, they know no social class whatsoever. And some people would be awfully embarrassed or uncomfortable going to a health unit or going to the methadone clinic to get these drugs and they'll want to go to their local pharmacy or someone they have a relationship with, but they don't want to necessarily produce the ID that you're that's being requested of them. And if we do something like that, aren't we actually putting them in greater danger? Um, I think if I understand what you're saying, is, is it that having to produce a health card at a pharmacy can, in, can yeah, get in the way of, of getting the kit? And I understand that. So at the health unit, we don't require um, a health card uh, I don't care if your name is Bugs Bunny. I just need something to fill in the blanks and you can get your kit. We do try to make it easier for people who can't go to the pharmacy if they don't have a health card or they're not comfortable to go, get, go to the pharmacy. So I, that's why I go to the three needle exchange sites um, and I try to meet people. I try to sit there and wait and hopefully coming to do an exchange, we can have a conversation around the naloxone. Um, and I, I hope that my being there, I am only one person, but making it easier for people to get that kit. The, the OHIP um, card for the pharmacy is all about the billing, so I can't really speak to, to yeah. that, Ruth, I don't. Right. And also, um, the Ministry of Health, they are, the Ministry of Health um, are trying to roll it out as quickly as possible, and they feel they've done a great job over the last year and a bit. Um, but the plans are to roll it out even further so that um, other places like eMERGE departments, like shelters and um, rooming homes have it. Because right now, like some of um, shelters and different places like that, they need to go to a pharmacy actually to get a kit and get the training in order to have it there. Um, so you're right, we, you know, we do give it out without a health card because we're allowed to do that. We have to follow the, the rules um, as laid out by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term long Care. Um, but hopefully, um, some of those restrictions will ease um, over time. Okay. I understand too, a year ago, nobody had any access to Naloxone. Mm -hmm. The fact that over a province, that in a year, you now have provincial access, but you just have to access it through a health card. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty forward thinking. That's pretty, uh, pretty impressive from that way. And as taxpayers too, it costs a lot of money to roll the program out and it takes time, right? It's an upswing. People need to be educated on it to know that the product is available to start out with and how you can get access to it. So, I mean, it's been a year and we're, as a province, wow. We've gotten up to family members now instead of just frontline users. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, all right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Peter. Anyways, I'm a uh, health and safety officer in the construction field. Uh, my uh, question is related to workplace. Uh, it's sort of a two-part question. Uh, number one, uh, I guess directed primarily to the health uh, unit. Are, are there any current initiatives 
to help bring awareness and these kinds of seminars uh, or programs to the workplace to educate employees as well as management and staff on um, substance abuse and especially the, the rise in fentanyl use. And then secondly, are there any initiatives uh, to provide um, additional or subsidiary training within the uh, first aid uh, groups or paramedic groups such as St. John Ambulance? Good question. We, we are restricted um, right now in terms of where we can do our training, um, but there are training options available for um, different people, different organizations. Um, um, like police and fire, they have arranged for training for their um, employees and then they have gone and actually got the naloxone independently, not through the health unit. Um, so there, there are options out there. I don't know what they all are. You could probably find that out from some of these places that um, have already arranged it. Um, but um, it, would be, it would be good to have a more concentrated and, um, you know, to have that information more widely available. Because I'm aware of one or two, but I couldn't, I wouldn't even want to mention them because I don't know how well that training went or, or that type of thing. But, um, you know, I, I think there are, there are companies that do it. Um, they've started to do it. It's just been in the last year that they've actually rolled it out. So it is available. No, do you see do you see any of this information or or, or education um, becoming streamlined or partnership in with say St. John's Ambulance or Red Cross so that people that are say obtaining their first aid or CPR um, are provided with this kind of information as well? That would that would be a great I think that's a great idea. And um, as we meet um, we, we meet on provincial teleconferences, um, and uh, Tin is scribbling down all of these questions here, and uh, I will make sure that that is brought forward. That, that's an excellent uh, point, hopefully being considered already, but if it isn't, we will make sure it's on the table. Contact the Ministry of Labor. The people, there's some people actually working on that as a working group. So if you contact the Ministry of Labor, the health and safety people there have some uh, resources that will be able to get you in contact with you. And Red Cross and First Aid and uh, St. John Ambulance are two independent organizations. So it's tough for us to enact policies that turn around and say you're independent and you can sort of do those types of things. But it'll be partnerships that they come along and obviously they're interested in things like that. I know there's interest in a provincial stance. So but Ministry of Labor will be a contact and they have a working group there. They'll be able, if you call their main number, they'll be able to put you in contact with somebody. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia. Um, my father, and that was my brother, that was just out, um, as he mentioned, we lost my brother to fentanyl. And uh, it was really hard to tell my children, and they are grown, but we didn't know any of this kind of information. So with that being said, um, we all know about D.A.R.E. and being in the elementary school. What can we do um, for high school and for colleges, because college students are like, big time on doing MDMA and ecstasy and molly and whatever you want to call it because it's cheaper than buying alcohol. So is there anything that we can do or is there any program out there right now that I can let my daughter know being in college that they, they can speak to? That's a, that's a great question and I can tell you that that was also part of the conversations uh, that were at the uh, original uh, Fentanyl Community Roundtable. Um, what you can do is, is this is a, a part of it. This is, you, you now know more, I hope, today um, than you did uh, yesterday, that you will use the website as a resource and that you will have those conversations. At our table is uh, both boards of education. Um, and I can tell you that they are intent on taking the message uh, to the schools. And I can tell you that our high school resource officers who are in um, all six high schools in the city, um, they are delivering uh, messages, uh, presentations, uh, specifically on the dangers of fentanyl, um, because that's how concerned we are. So, um, but this is all a part of it. This is education and awareness. What you learn here, you, 
you take these questions to those organizations that you think need to know more about it or need to teach more about it, whether so it's your own health and safety committees or whether it's the school your children attend or whether you sit down yourself with your children and have these uh, conversations. Okay, thank you. And I would like to mention that um, St. Leonard's does have um, addictions counselors that go into the schools as well and uh, do it, they do at our office um, on site there, so providing individual counseling, assessment and referral. So that's also available too. Thanks, Julie. Hi, I lost my brother in September uh, to fentanyl. The biggest thing I have a hard time wrapping my head around is this is great here educating people because when I got the toxicology report back from the coroner, I called my 19-year-old son upstairs and his friend and I showed it to him. But the thing I cannot, and I'm, this isn't directed, at, anger isn't directed at anybody up there, I cannot understand how somebody can sell somebody a lethal dose and not be accountable. Now, I understand that we've been talking about if somebody phones and, and they did one take of it, but if you get somebody that has an ounce of it, a pound of it, or whatever, I think, and I would like the, the chief and Chris to comment on this, is I think we need to send the messages to the dirtbags that are selling this and not just a little slap on the hand and they're out again and all these people are dying. I think we should get the source of the problem. And you kill the supply, you'll kill the, the demand. And I think that if we put a stricter, you get caught with this much, you're going to prison. No questions asked. The coroner told me there was three times the lethal dose in my brother's system. So I cannot understand if you catch these guys with this and it is tested and there's a lethal dose to kill somebody, why they have no responsibility to somebody dying. i just like an answer. Yes, well, first of all, um, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, secondly, we're, we're dealing with something that's very, it's quite complex. And uh, it's, it's not that there's going to be an, an easy answer to every situation to be able to take it through the criminal justice system and uh, arrive at the outcome that you're looking for. And you, you made reference to um, stopping the supply, um, therefore uh, having an impact on the demand. Um, there's also the issue of maybe we need to deal with the demand. And are more resources, should more resources put into law enforcement to stop the importation, the production, the distribution? Or would those resources more be more effectively spent on addiction treatment? So we always have this, this dilemma that we deal with. I can tell you that in law enforcement, we do what we can with the resources we have to try to make a, a dent on the supply. Sir, I think yep. you're... Uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but oh, that's fine. I, I, I have friends that are police officers and my son's going to school in September to be a police officer. I understand your hands are tied. I'm talking at the federal level to raise the laws to these guys. So if I'm going to start selling cocaine laced with fentanyl, I know if I get caught, I'm going to prison. I'm not going to jail for six months or time served or all this other. It's a hard sentence. Do we need to go federally to get a harder penalty to fix? I get your righteous anger. I get your righteous anger. And I think the chief is trying to reinforce the fact that, and I know what you're saying too. Um, I can tell you fentanyl, sentence rates have gone up because part of it's a learning process. And I'm, I'm not trying to be blunt and I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. Part of it's a learning process with the courts as well as they start getting rulings of bigger sentences that tends to be something now that the other courts look at. You go, this person got eight years for fentanyl trafficking, so I'm gonna give this person eight years as well, like-minded cases. But cases start off, when impaired driving first started off, <clears throat> it was a fine, right? Or it was something along those lines. But as people sort of died and those types of things, it ramped up. We don't remember 
when drunk driving first came along and the slaps on the wrist people got, mm -hmm. it just sort of ramped up as it went along. And this is the same thing. And it has a natural ebb and flow to it. Like it, that's the way sensing works. It needs cases to build upon for people to build up a, a case resource to turn around and say, this sense will happen for this case and this like-minded and that. And you always hear judges refer to our versus whatever to have a case study. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. It's um, a time thing, right? And, yeah. and that's it. Like if we were talking 40 years ago with drunk driving, this would be the same conversation of you coming in okay. and saying my, my son got killed by a drunk driver and how come this person isn't going to, because during that time it wasn't thought of that way, right? Like it was okay, you had a couple pops after, after work and then you drove yourself home to go spend time with the family or you drove your, or whatever and it's just, we work in a world that is so quick, mm -hmm. we can get on our phones, I can find you information about the toxicology reports right now, but we forget that we work in a world that need some preface, we need some understanding, we need some relevance before these things happen, before we sort of take that time to up it to that point. So I, I understand your race's anger. Listen, I would, I'd love to say to you today that people that traffic fentanyl are going to get X amount of years, but that's, let's talk in two years. Okay. Let's, and, and, and that's what I mean, like give it time. I know we're all impatient, I know you're hurting, and I know those types of things are going on, but yeah, let's give it some time as these cases build up and judges get more familiar with the products and they get the training and everything along those lines. Give it time. Okay, thank you. So we've got time for one last question and then we're, I'm going to show you the uh, Fentanyl Can Kill website and then we're going to give an opportunity for uh, the naloxone training to take place in the room next door. So please go ahead with your last question. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this has been put into place, but I know out in BC they've been kind of um, campaigning the government to do something after somebody finally puts their hand up and says, I need help. They have a waiting period before they can get into rehab. My son didn't make it. He didn't have that. He put his hand up, said he needed to get help. In the waiting list, he was turned back into the street from the hospital because there was a waiting time where he had to go into rehab. And he was putting all his ducks in a row and getting things in place, like getting um, counseling, getting whatever. But he couldn't get into that rehab facility. And what I think communities need to do is instead, like I think the education and awareness part of this is going really well. I really do. And I think you're to be commended for that. What I would like to see as a next step is that when the person, because we know people who are addicts, until they put their hands up and say, we need help here, it's really hard to help them. So once they take that step, is this community, I, I'm not even from, I'm from Brantford originally, live in Sarnia now, but uh, I came here to be with my sister because we're trying to make sense of all of this and what we would like to see the communities do and I don't know if it's a volunteer thing but let's get these people some help because addicts can't do it on their own and when they say they need help they need it now they don't need it two days from now two hours from now they need it right then right there when they finally say I need help that's when they need it my son was one of 13 who passed away in the same day out in Burnaby BC you know, that, that, that was big in the news. He was one of the 13 who didn't make it that day. So I would like to see something help these people afterwards. Because once they say they need help, they really do need it right away. And I'm not sure if you've got that at your table that you're discussing, if that's part of the component. I hope it is. Because you can't just do it like you're saying, by law enforcement and by, um, you're absolutely right, do something about the demand. Let's get people. Let's get people not wanting to take the drugs in the first place. Those that are taking the drugs, get off the drugs because you're not going to get rid of the supply until you get rid of the demand. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'd like to uh, now uh, turn your attention to our Fentanyl Can Kill website. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our partners uh, at Octopus Red, Laura and Lucas Duguid here at the front. 
Um, they have been amazing partners uh, with us in developing the Fentanyl Can Kill website. Um, their uh, amazing intelligence and ingenuity um, and skill set has been uh, greatly appreciated by our team, and we sincerely thank you for that. Um, is the website up? There it is. Okay, great. We're not going to take uh, take you through in a lot of detail um, on the website right now, but we do uh, ask. Uh, many of you already been to the website. We know um, when the website was launched a number of weeks ago. Uh, we understand it had a huge number of hits, greater that has been seen um, in recent memory, is what we understand. Um, there's a lot of resources on this website, so we do encourage you to. To, um, to review what is on the website and please share the link with uh, everybody uh, that you can uh, think to share the website link with. Um, uh, the information we hope will uh, be very useful for, you know, for yourself and others. Jordan was irrepressible. He was high energy. Well, he was a great kid. He was full of life. He was a, a real handful. He walked on his eight-month birthday, and he never stopped. He was born with a, an adventurous spirit. Big baseball player, um, skateboarding. He, uh, he was really active, kind of a typical kid. For the last five years of his life, I worried every single moment of every single day. Somehow, I just knew my goal was to keep him alive. Jordan was in his early 20s. He was working construction. He hurt his back, lifting some wood. The doctor prescribed him an opiate. That opiate became his focus in life once a person is addicted to a drug it is the main thing on that person's mind finding it paying for it taking it and then finding some more it consumes your life it was so gradual but yet it was just getting crazier and crazier just his lifestyle and he would he'd do a job he was, he was working as a chimney sweep and he'd he'd uh, he'd get a check for like six thousand bucks gone he was not trustworthy he was unable to focus jordan was so addicted that he wasn't getting enough from the doctor so he was seeking it elsewhere and he was seeking it on the street he had stomach problems he had sleeplessness it was very hard on his body he came to us and said i need to detox i need help here i can't handle this I can't manage it anymore we got him into a detox program he was good for for a little while after that and then the call of the drug he couldn't resist it he got back into it in the end what happened was Jordan took several drugs three of which were prescribed to him and the combination killed him Jordan was probably responsible for the best day of my life, you know, the day he was born and the, and the day he died. The worst day. Of course, when he died, our lives were just shattered. I'm still trying to figure out how to live my life not being a mom. When I had a son, a tremendous amount of energy was put into his life, and now it just disappeared in an instant. We won't have grandchildren, and we won't have him around in our old age. We are really ignorant of just how, how devastating these drugs can be and how addictive they are, especially the opiate-based drugs. I don't think kids in particular understand what they're getting into. They need to know that this can ruin their lives and, in fact, can kill them. Parents need to be vigilant and not rationalize behavior changes. They need to be compassionate. If one is angry and judgmental, 
nothing will push the kid away faster. Don't ignore the situation. Don't, don't pretend like it's going to go away. It can happen to anyone. Sharing his story helps me heal. If it saves one kid, it's worth it. He was a normal, everyday, healthy young man. He was working, he was vibrant, he was a loving person. Every day I think about him, you know, just remember him, focus on the good things, the good memories. He was just starting his life. Had he been able to get off of the drugs, he would have been fine. He would have been a successful, amazing guy.